The Tony Hawk Pro Skater series is undeniably one of the most influential video game franchises of all time, impacting not just the sports game genre of the industry, but the real world skateboarding scene in a major way. I know I went out and bought a skateboard after I first played them, and I know that's the case for many. And given that I've now played through every single Tony Hawk game, what better way to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Pro Skater franchise than by ranking every single Tony Hawk level? This is it. This is what doing the Hawktober special annually for the past three years has all been leading up to. An epic journey through all of the amazing locations we visited along the way. Because why settle for a top 10 when you can do a top 165? Strap yourselves in. Now, given this is such a massive undertaking, first we need to quickly cover some ground rules. Of course, many of these levels have appeared across multiple games with various revisions and adjustments. So to keep things simple, we will be counting all of these together as a single location. Only if a level has seen a major change will it be eligible to appear again. Handheld levels on weaker systems obviously can't be expected to follow this rule, so again, for the sake of simplicity, as long as these weaker downgrades still represent the originals with similar themes and obstacles, they will again be grouped in with the primary versions. As you might expect, we will only be looking at officially released levels for the series. Transitional areas and non-levels, such as the hallways in American Wasteland, will not be included. The same goes for customizable locations, and levels that are just a half-pipe, small skill-based courses and dedicated tutorial spaces are also not eligible to appear. This is about the classic format for courses, open streets, dedicated skate terrain and downhill maps. Now, how are we going to rank all of these? We're looking primarily at the gameplay here. How fun are the courses to navigate? Is there a lot of potential for tricks and combo lines? Then to a lesser extent, the theming and structure of each area. Now, while many of these do take inspiration from real-world skate parks or other locations, their accuracy to the real-life equivalent is not being figured into the ranking process, because we're here to talk about how they work for the games, first and foremost. So, with all of these criteria in mind and being strictly enforced, I've done my best to keep these rankings as unbiased, fair and balanced as possible for every game. I'm willing to ignore forced motion controls ruining a good level if it's a well-designed level to begin with. And finally, just before we begin, Tony Hawk's latest game, Skate Jam on Mobile, is officially disqualified from the rankings. This game recycles all of its levels from the Skateboard Party series, and I'm not having that. These are not Tony Hawk levels, plain and simple. The cheeky bastards pulling a stunt like that. Alright, now that we're all familiar with the rules, there is only one question left. What is the absolute worst Tony Hawk level of the entire franchise? Number 165 goes to... <laughs> Huck Jam Park from Tony Hawk Shred. This level is just a total catastrophe, and unless you've played it for yourself, then you really can't comprehend how loathsome and frustrating this place is to navigate. It begins with a split path. Down one side, you have a crazy long grinding roller coaster with the widest jumps you could ever hope to make just constantly in your way. And down the other side, you essentially have the exact same thing again, equally as irritating to get through thanks to how easy it is to fall or get stuck and have to start the entire thing over again. 
Maybe this wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't plagued with mandatory motion control, but it's still not fun or interesting just slowly working your way through this. And that's only the half of it. At the bottom of each section is a bunch of fun houses, sci-fi obstacles, and so much random shit only here to try and be funny and epic for the finale to this game. But it's not funny. It's pathetically desperate, actually. And again, it's topped off with so many hazards that continuously result in you being reset, forcing you to play this shit significantly longer than anyone with a sane mind would want to. For all of its effort to be something special, all you get here is a boring cluster of unhinged monotony. It's awful, so let's move on, because we've got a lot of shit to swim through here. Level 164 is Tokyo. Tokyo from Tony Hawk's motion, of course. What makes this gigantic, barren, lifeless, empty street course slightly better than the previous level? Well, nothing really. I guess because there is literally nothing here to do, it's not as frustrating, but that's really not saying much. How is there just no obstacles here? We've got endless streets and hills with only a minute amount of ledges to grind and an empty fountain to trick inside of. This is proof, if I ever needed it, that size isn't everything. And for a level released so late into the franchise, this is embarrassing. Up next is Skylines, a secret level in the North American exclusive Pro Skater 2X on Xbox. It's actually a decent remaster of the first two games, but good god does it fail here. While the previous level we looked at had no objects on the course, Skylines has all of the objects, just fucking everywhere. Just try to find some room to do tricks in this place. Aside from the pool area and some high wire grinds, there is no space to land tricks. You just smash into everything, and that's not fun. Try to get some air, you hit the roof. Try to do a big jump, you hit the floor. And trust me, you will fall off this level so many times in a single session that you will actually want to go and jump off of a building. I just can't believe the sheer lack of design here. None of the objects flow and you have so much trouble just trying to look around because there is always something in your way. It's like a bad created park that I made when I was 8 years old. And as the final reward for completing the game, Skylines gets the reward for most depressing secret level in all of the Pro Skater series. Here we have another level from Tony Hawk's Motion, a snowboarding course. I use the term course very loosely here though because of course there is nothing to do here. Aside from just go down the slope, we've got a few lonely rails and the occasional jump to hit, and nothing else. This might be somewhat realistic for a snowboard track in real life, given the sport needs a lot more room compared to the compact form of skate parks, so I'll use this as a demonstration that, just because something works in real life, that does not mean it's anywhere near enjoyable for a video game. Man, it's just starting to hit me really hard right now that we have a long way to go before these levels are going to be worth playing. Downtown LA from American Skatelands Game Boy Advance version is incredibly similar in design to Tokyo we saw a moment ago. Yeah, because there isn't a single shred of design here. It's another big wide open street course with almost no skatable terrain. Beautiful. We do get to skate La Brea Tar Pits, but the rest of this place is empty streets and coffee shops with no heart or soul. Another garbage covered gem from this game is the Beverly Hills School area. The big problem here is the layout. It's a vertical nightmare with limited options for getting up or down. It's actually easier and quicker to use the open world and visit the other levels to loop back to the top of this place. It's ridiculous. Why have I got to do that? And what is here to skate? 
Not much. We've got some recycled gaps from classic school levels, mixed in with a terrible lack of planning for this stage, as once again, there is almost no room to manoeuvre. Time for more rooftop action with Rooftops. This was a level exclusive to the GBA version of Pro Skater 2. Good. Look, there is nothing inherently bad about this place, but there is just nothing going on. And that seems to be a consistent theme for these lower ranks. We can jump across buildings, grind the billboard, and not much else. Sure, this is on a weak portable system, but many of the original levels were ported perfectly, so I'm afraid that hardware limitations is no excuse for this one. Let's look at more Game Boy advancing up to Underground's second level, the Mall. Not to be confused with the classic Mall level from the original Pro Skater, this place is again very basic with its design. We've got three floors, each with less to trick off than the previous, with the only real fun being found on the escalators. This is another one of these levels where we have some selection of obstacles, but no decent flow from one to the next. Disappointing. And speaking of disappointing, Tony Hawk Shred is back already with a level that hits much closer to home for me, Melbourne, Australia. This is a bad downhill course. Thematically, I must say that although the Melbourne city views at night are gorgeous, this game does not do them justice. It's dark and grimy looking and it just looks ugly. As for the track itself, I really don't know what to say about this one. Most of the level is spent just pushing and pushing, sometimes with a little ramp or rail to play with, but not very often. And in less than a minute, you're in the final stretch hopping over trains and getting stuck constantly on the rails. It's bad. There is nothing else to say. Number 156, Zermatt, which again comes from motion on the DS. This snowboard level actually has some character to it, with some big jumps to start off, split high and low paths, but while the other course was wide open, this one is so claustrophobic with even less hazards and stuff to trick off. And best of all, you can't even see the level most of the time. Thankfully, you can get from top to bottom in less than a minute, so the pain doesn't last long. But trust me, it is excruciating pain. My god! We're only 10 levels into this thing, and I'm already deeply regretting the decision to make this video. And on top of that, we've also almost eliminated two entire games from the rankings in just the first few minutes. They're not finished yet, but let's just see how long they can last. Alright, 10 down, 155 more to go. I hope you've got some popcorn or something because we're going to be here for a while. Number 155, we've got Hawaii from Downhill Jam's Game Boy Advance port. Even though graphically this is an incredibly weak game, it does actually include some well recreated courses from the main entries with some tolerable gameplay to accompany them. But this track doesn't reflect that at all, which sucks, and this is the big finale for the entire game. Most of this is just rolling through canyons and eventually the beachside area, with the only notable landmark being the big tree you can grind into. It's pretty underwhelming given there are only a handful of rails and ramps to hit, and it definitely fits in with many of the other levels we've seen already. Another secret level from 2X, the subway here is less of a subway and more of a subway platform. A tiny, undetailed subway platform with some weird grind physics and a train car to jump through. If you go down the track, there is a hidden room with a crocodile under the mesh floor, but only has a few extra ramps. Sadly, it's the most skatable part of this map, which just goes to show how woefully whack this place is. But now it's time to really piss a lot of people off, because up next, we're visiting the classic Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. 
What level from this masterpiece could possibly be featured this early on? Chopper Drop. All this level consists of is a half pipe, stranded out in the middle of the ocean, so technically, it's not even eligible for the list. However, Crane Drop from Pro Skater 2X is eligible, as this version includes some added platforms and other junk, doubling the size of this location and completely transforming it. Not really. It's still just as pathetic. I honestly don't even know why they bothered trying to do anything with this place instead of just deleting it outright. All of these extra little platforms and pipes to grind don't even flow or serve any real purpose, so it's just a waste of our time. Uh oh, more shred levels incoming. This time it's Morocco, and maybe it wouldn't be so bad if it was easier to navigate. If you fall off the side of certain paths, that's it. There is no way to get back up there without trying again. But otherwise, it's just a generic downhill course. It's not even an interesting location either. We're just hopping across buildings and in the end, shipping containers. It's a lot more fun marvelling at this game's terrible congratulatory speeches at the end of the course than it is to actually play it. Seriously, that was awesome. Really awesome. From Morocco, let's hop over to Santorini for much of the same issues. Jumping and grinding along roofs and ledges, sneaking down through narrow corridors because tight, confused spaces make for great skateboarding action. Probably the most offensive thing in this level for me has to be the cruise ship off in the background. It's not even textured, so it looks like clumps of Play-Doh. What a total disgrace. And it's not even like they tried to hide it either. That sums up the whole thing. There is a cool part at the finish line where you can drop a piano to launch over a shark, but... I don't want to give this place any props for its props, so let's move on. Now it's time for the Boom 2X Tony Hawk Show, Ride's feverishly mediocre finale level. It's the classic Japanese game show stereotype for... some reason. Honestly, it's got nothing to do with anything else in the game, so I don't know. It's much the same as the Huck Jam Park, trying so hard to be hip and funny, but instead falling flat on its face. Ninja training amongst bamboo rails, weird anti-gravity loops, a Godzilla room. It's all crap that sounds a hell of a lot more fun explaining it than it is to actually experience firsthand. It's lame at the end of the day. You don't need to do all of this for a fun ending. Just give me a good, well-designed, solid Tokyo level for my finale, and I'll be happy. But no, we got this shit. Alright, where are we going next? Hey man, I'll meet you down on Lower Wacker Drive. Let's skate. Jesus. Lower Wacker Drive is a terrible level, even by ride standards. This underground tunnel is mostly made up of grind patterns across the rails and ledges, with a few ramps mixed in. But for the most part, you'll be having fun getting stuck in set tricks while the game flat out refuses to let you complete the goal at hand. Lots of fun. Not to mention, it's also just not a nice place to be. Everything is grey concrete. We're like little skate trolls hiding down here, whacking off our unresponsive deck controllers. It's a joke. And speaking of joke, now it's time to enter Pro Skater 5, the bastardization of this series' once proud name. Thanks for that, Robomodo. Thanks for giving us such a weak beach skate park with next to no interesting items to skate, while we can clearly see the classic Venice level in the background as a constant reminder of how fucking miserable of a life you must have to be playing this game in the first place. Fuck! Bonfire Beach has nothing going on. Nothing. Have you noticed the pattern yet? We need stuff to skate. Why is that such a taboo concept for some of these skateboarding games? All the uninspired fire power-ups in the world can't save this place. 
And you know, it's pretty awkward when the Game Boy Color version of the original Pro Skater is placed higher than 2015's epic flop. Now, for this game, we're going to include all of these five street courses into a single spot on the list, simply because they're all basically palette swaps of each other and are otherwise identical. Every area includes a mess of rails for long grind combos and ramps to trick off. Yeah, all three tricks in the game. But thanks to the fast pace, all of these are fun to play, and the fourth harbour area in particular is incredibly skill-based. Not a whole lot to say, but still worth the time. Take that, Pro Skater 5! Now here we have an example of a level with different versions, the car factory in Project 8. While the 7th gen version of this place is compact with some quality pieces, Shaba Game's 6th gen port is another huge location. What we have here are a whole bunch of different rooms and conveyor belts linked uncreatively with numerous hallways. There is an outdoors plaza, office rooms, and admittedly, several decent combo lines through this place, but due to the segmented maze-like design, it can be very easy to get lost given everything looks so similar. As far as skate opportunities go, this level is definitely a step above what we've already looked at. It's just not fluent or engaging to play through in the slightest. In at 145 is Skater Island, on the Game Boy Color version of Pro Skater 3. Some of the levels in this game faithfully recreate their original versions well enough to be grouped alongside them. But then we have levels like this one that are different and worthy of getting their own spot on the list. So let's go over a couple. Skater Island here is an outdoors competition level with horrible layout choices, especially for a competition level. This is an incredibly difficult game, so the lack of any decent combo areas is really what lets this place down in the end. The airport suffers for the same reasons, but it's worth noting that this level actually plays out on the tarmac amongst machinery and planes, which is fun, much different to the terminal interior we're all familiar with. An interesting difference, but still not a great location. Next is Los Angeles, which takes place on a beach cliffside as opposed to the city centre. Despite this, we've still got an earthquake to trigger by grinding various rails, along with some surf shacks and boardwalks to trick. Once again, it's interesting to see such a different take on this classic, beloved location for the series. However, that doesn't make it good by any means. I don't know, I still think it's kind of neat. Finally is Suburbia, which doesn't include any of the major landmarks we all know from this level, but it's fun for the large pit in the center covered in rails for long combos and the various roofs to jump and trick off. This is a massive location by the standards of the entire series, so to think this is crammed onto a Game Boy cartridge is impressive. None of these are super amazing levels, but considering the system and time period next to other games we've looked at so far on this list, these are all surprisingly decent. Back to ride for the Boom X2 Vertical U-Ramp GO! What an amazing title. This precedes the lengthy endurance level and is simply a whole bunch of stacked half pipes and ramps, constantly crashing through stuff and hitting high scores. Technically, this is just a half-pipe level, but it's also not just a half-pipe, so it's eligible in my opinion. This actually is fun to play through as well, but because of its simplicity, I've had to place it lower down the list. Amazing, though, that such a simple level could outshine the epic failure that followed it. Time for some more downhill jamming for 140 with Vale Mountain on the Game Boy Advance. For a mountain course, we do get to see everything despite the limitations here. We start in the snow, see the ski lift, and trek down through the woodland area off a big waterfall into a canyon. But it lacks stuff to skate, which sucks. There is so few places to grind, so you're mostly left to navigate the course without much excitement. 
Alright, let's knock out a game from the rankings. At 139, we've got the Skateland Warehouse on the Game Boy Advance. The DS version is not eligible, as that one is actually customizable. So what we're stuck with is this mess. Again, what is it with the final levels of these games being such a disgrace? Not that I expected much after all the other filth we've already seen from this game, but come on. It's just a generic factory with some ramps and not much else to do. I wish there was more to say on this one, but uh, that's a lie. Let's get the hell out of here ASAP. The final level exclusive to this game we have to talk about is the San Francisco area, and thankfully, there actually is some stuff to talk about here. It opens with the Golden Gate Bridge, which can be grinded up and over, the dock area extends out over the water to a hidden ramp, and by climbing up the streets, you'll find a super long ramp that leads all the way back down. Shame that it's not used for a mega jump or anything. All of these landmarks are cool, but as usual, they just don't flow together in any way that makes this level fun to play. And with that, American Skateland on GBA is officially eliminated from the rankings. I'd cry for the loss, but instead, I'm crying for joy. Good riddance. Now, here is yet another final secret level that just doesn't live up to the work required to unlock it. Pro Skater 4's GBA port had an exclusive level which was unlocked by collecting hidden packages, GTA 3 style. But what you get for all of that trouble is an incredibly malnourished sequel to an amazing secret level from Pro Skater 3 on GBA. But more on that later. All we get here are some awkward walkways with a bottomless pit below, and a scientist walking around with some monkeys. Of note is a gap asking, have you played Pro Skater 2 and 3? Yeah, I have, and they were a lot better than this shit. From Pro Skater 4 onto Pro Skater 5. Yeah, as if it were that straightforward. Here we've got another rooftops area. Something about this concept just screams, kill me right now, because this is a bad level. Across the different buildings are some decent areas, but it's the navigation that ruins this place. We've got a big tower under construction in the middle to link these areas, but unfortunately, the epicenter of this place is a void of dead air. And the only other chance you have of navigating is picking up the double jump power-up to hop across huge gaps. Why make a level that literally cannot be traversed without some gimmicky power-up? It really pisses me off. We're 30 goddamn levels in and yet they don't seem to be getting any better. How long is this going to take? 135, back to Morocco for another downhill level. Thankfully, this one actually has an interesting environment to go with it, starting off in the canyon with rivers and camps, and working your way down towards a street area. There are plenty of things to grind on, which is a welcome change of pace, but otherwise, this is a fairly standard entry onto the list. Time for another level that actually looks like it comes from a Tony Hawk game. The Capital from Project 8. This one is not good. All we get is this government building with a bowl in the middle and some random ledges along the outside walls. The most fun part is getting up to the roof, then this quickly becomes a lot more enjoyable to skate. But there is only so much you can do up here. The weaker 6th gen version has a much more significant space outdoors, but take a guess what the problem is here. It's essentially empty with no interesting items. Moving on. Now here is one that's bound to rustle some feathers. Santa Monica from American Wasteland. This area includes several memorable story goals from the series, with an alien grind to bring down the ferris wheel, destroying the building and the stairs, but have you ever actually skated this level for a significant period of time? There is nothing to do here. This is the definition of a level built for the objectives instead of being complemented by them. 
and it's weak. Aside from the grind and mini quarter pipe out over the ruined shack and the roller coaster grind, before it gets ruined, there is just no interesting skate terrain here. A couple of pools for vert and a car garage to launch off, but otherwise, there is nothing to do here. And all the way down at 1.32, we've got our first appearance from the first Pro Skater game, Streets, also known as San Francisco. Fun fact, this is the only level from this game that, excluding the 2X remaster, never featured in any other game. And rightfully so. Of course, this was the first game, so there weren't really any standards or expectations, but all of the other levels managed to stand the test of time, for the most part at least, but not this one. So why is that? It is just far too big and empty with nothing going on. Each little area you can find feels distant from everything else, with no continuous flow. The only decent places to score are across the road between two ramps, with a trolley constantly moving in your way. You've got the room with the sun bowl, and then the big jump off of the roof, and that's really all there is for interesting landmarks. The vast plazas and awkward dead corners of this map are just not what makes for a fun pro skater level. Vast street courses was always something the series attempted from the very first game, and I think it's safe to say it was a huge success translating the much more popular skating style into these games. But when it bombed, it bombed hard. So keeping that in mind, let's prepare to totally annihilate an entire game right now with one special combo. Underground on Game Boy Advance really struggled with its level design, featuring many disjointed and or empty street courses all within a single game. And given that they're all very similar levels, let's just do them all together right now and get it over with. Up first is Battery Park, which consists of 40% empty road, 40% awkward and boring park area, 10% rooftop gaps, and 10% skate park. If you need more than that basic description to know why this level is mediocre, then I'm surprised you've even made it this far into the video. Next is another Santa Monica level with another empty street and another boring park area. Thankfully, we also have the beach down below with some fun pipes to vert in, but the rooftops in this level are all covered with garbage and a basically wasted space. Moving on, now we have the Bronx. This area is much smaller in size, and thankfully, the buildings here are actually fun to climb. But aside from that, it doesn't have much to offer. The stadium area is boring and the small makeshift park doesn't have much to work with and even gets in the way of what we do have to skate. At 128, Hollywood isn't much better, again with wide open empty streets and roofs which are fun but quite tired at this point. Some of these places have incredibly basic skate parks in the backyard, but that's about all this place has to offer. And finally for Underground on Game Boy Advance, we have San Diego. This place doesn't represent its console original at all, with ghetto pools, factories under the overpass, and an extensive waterfront area that better represents the Manhattan level than San Diego. This spot is fun to skate, but the plaza above is the complete opposite. So, for all of the levels exclusive to this port, there is not much in the way of variety or interesting structure. Disappointing coming from a Tony Hawk game with Underground in the title, so it's a good thing that this game is finished. Alright, let's immediately eliminate another game from the rankings, Tony Hawk's Motion. I bet you forgot we weren't finished with this one just yet, but probably to many people's surprise and disgust, the Dubai skate park level is actually not the worst thing ever. Yes, this is an incredibly basic skate park area, but had it been in any other Tony Hawk game, I think it would have been a lot of fun. 
The ledges, vert ramps, and bowls all surround this building, which you can actually go inside and find a secluded area to skate, with a tunnel back out the other side. It's not great, which is why it's still so low on the list, but considering we knocked out all of the other levels from motion within the first 10 positions on this list, then Dubai must be pretty okay. Time for Venice Beach, an absolutely classic pro skater area, which was revisited in Ride as a downhill course. Okay, sure. This is the opening level of the game, so the terrain is incredibly basic, with few rails and benches to grind. Most exciting is hopping the large gaps across the various roofs and sculptures, but otherwise, it doesn't have much going on for it. So, because of this game's reputation, this Venice level serving as the world's introduction to the game's wonky motion controls will forever be its legacy. During the production of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, there was initially a level set in Paris going to be included in the game. You could skate around under the Eiffel Tower and explore the area, but was eventually cut and never released. So I think it's fascinating that this level survived into the Game Boy Color port, which is what we're looking at here. As you can see, the famous Paris toll gate is featured, along with many other iconic landmarks, as you can see. Yeah, it really doesn't live up to the hype introduction I just gave it. Sorry about that. This place features more oil trucks than Eiffel Towers, but for all of the levels in this version of the game, it might be one of the best for scoring high combos. If you've seen my review of this and the other Game Boy Color Tony Hawk games, then you know how fucking brutal this game can be. So, getting an unreleased level that is actually a lot of fun to play is incredibly appreciated. And while we still have plenty more Pro Skater 3 courses to look at, this is the final entry from this version of the game. Honestly, it performed damn well given how limited the colour is next to... Oh, I don't know. The Game Boy Advance and DS? That's for sure. In at 123 is Chicago from Downhill Jam. We've seen a few Downhill Jam courses from the Game Boy Advance port already, so it's time we started including some from the console version. This one starts off on the parking garage roof and moves all through the snaking hallways of the mall. This makes it a very tight level to navigate thanks to all of the sharp turns, and with many of the shortcuts crowded with junk, it simply doesn't suit the fast racing speeds as we move through here. Enjoyable is the roller coaster and skating through a cinema out the other side, with several areas for big jumps, but it just doesn't give us enough room to manoeuvre it comfortably, so it's easily one of the weakest courses out of all of the versions of this game. Speaking of weak, we have another 2x exclusive level with The Club. What is it with this game? All of the original content is being knocked out of the rankings before we've even hit the top 100. The club is made up of two rooms, with one containing some more traditional skating area, but the other has a big dance floor taking up 90% of the space with some grinds along the bar area. Moving up to the second floor, we can find a hidden room with a bunch of ramps and some platforms suspended above the dance floor. The biggest issue here is that none of these levels feel connected, especially with the actual skate park just placed off on its own in another room. Why not transform the actual club into a skate park? That's what good Tony Hawk levels do. But worst of all is the entire time you're here, the amazing soundtrack of Pro Skater 2 is never played, replaced instead with this spastic techno monstrosity. How is anyone supposed to get a good flow going with this shit blaring? Ah, next level, please. While we're on the topic of Pro Skater 2, let's take a look at the Nintendo 64 exclusive level making its guest appearance from Matt Hoffman's Pro BMX, The Hoffman Factory. As usual for a secret level in the series, it's an underwhelming reward. Just a basic room with some ramps and a pool. 
I mean, it's not bad, just not all that good either. It's generic, if I could sum it up in a single word. In a shocking turn of events, it's actually more fun as a BMX course, as it's really not equipped for the high combo scoring format of the Pro Skater games. Here is a level I actually really enjoyed when I was younger, but in my experience, I can see now that it's a bit of a mess. Machu Picchu is the perfect location for a game like Downhill Jam. I just love the narrow rocky walkways extending over these massive pits and all of the big dives through the ruined hills. But spending so much time in the air where you have no real control over your skater makes it so easy to fly off the edge. Plus with the lumpy bumpy ground, this is more of a technical thing. Your skater bounces all over and it wrecks any momentum you can muster up. Throw in on top of that the same issues as the Chicago course, being just a little too tight to navigate and being one of the shortest levels in the game. Great, amazing aesthetic, but less impressive to play through. Keeping with the race theme, let's take one final look at the GBA version of Downhill Jam with another Paris level. Montmartre thankfully resembles Paris much better than the Game Boy Color level we saw a moment ago. With many long stretching pathways, lots to grind and air off, riding up over the Arc de Triomphe and finishing under a sketchy looking Eiffel Tower. Really, for what it is, this is an incredibly fun course. I wish we had have seen a fully realised version on console, but this is all we got in the end. It's alright. We've got plenty of room to navigate, which is nice. The entire thing is just lacking in interesting and varied obstacles. Now for the construction site. The premise here is actually great on paper. An unfinished building made up of ramps and rails where you can climb up to the top and skate, but it can be quite awkward to do so. The slightest wrong move and you fall off, meaning you have to start back from the bottom, which gets exhausting after a while. The rest of the terrain is mostly wide transition areas with quarter pipes and a few rails. However, the few buildings in the background also offer some additional little areas. Again though, it's very easy to fall out of these places, so it's the usual lack of fluidity that presents many of the issues here. The Tony Hawk games have always had a hard-on for two things. Needless destruction and bizarre sci-fi inspired levels. Starting off with Roswell in the very first game and ending off with the asteroid belt in Pro Skater 5. Again, this is the final level of the game and just going by the theme alone, it actually looks really fun to play around in. Lots of pools and high wire rails, frequent don't look down spots, but then you actually do go over the edge because of this level's fatal flaw, moon physics. They fucking break this place because it's near impossible to match the distance between obstacles. This place was clearly built so that it would function without the low gravity stuff. But really, it should have been designed to a larger scale to compensate for the added distances we can make. It was always fun entering in cheat codes to access moon physics, but trying to complete the actual goals like this is frustrating, plummeting your enjoyment back down to earth. And while we're on the topic, let's introduce Underground 2's first level for the day, appropriately named Pro Skater. This is like a portal into the future. As a reward for beating the story mode, we get a spaceship infested with aliens and a very limited option of trickable objects. Messing around some, you discover that there is actually a mini narrative to this level and by pushing the buttons, the shuttle in the center launches through a portal. This brings us to the Mayan temple area, which I must say, blew my mind as a kid. But the reality is, this is more of that trying way too hard to be funny attitude that only started to infect the series with Underground 2. Again, there isn't much for skating here, and triggering the next event into the final area, we reach the depths of hell, which still doesn't have much to skate in this skateboarding game. 
you've got the big boost spine down the middle, and that's about it. And I always had more fun glitching out of this thing than actually skating it. Of course, this is a level that is fun the first time you see it as a kid, but really lacks any further replay value thanks to the boring easter eggs and missing skate park features. Now for level 115. I hope you're all familiar with the classic School 2 level from the second Pro Skater, because Pro Skater 5 took that iconic level and worked hard to worsen every attribute of it. School 3, or School 1.5 as I like to call it, because half the fucking map is missing, is just a shitty transplant at the end of the day. Many of the incredibly fun areas are either dumbed down or removed entirely, and the objectives here are some of the worst this game has to offer. The gymnasium and adjacent outdoor area remains mostly untouched, so in a way, there is still some good here because, after all, it is based on an amazing level. But it's such a crime how what might seem like a few innocent alterations can just totally butcher this level's quality. If there is anything we've learned from looking at every level like this, it's that exclusive and secret content simply doesn't live up to the standard of your regular levels. Here we have Downhill, which first appeared as an unlockable level in the PlayStation 1 and N64 versions of Pro Skater 3, then reappeared in the 6th gen versions of Project 8. Both of these are the same concept, skate down a big long hill with a few ramps and rails on either side to meet some skatable terrain at the bottom. This was Tony's original concept for the Pro Skater series, and man, good call whoever shot that idea down because this is pretty boring. There are only so many ways to hit the course with the limited obstacles at your disposal, and once you're at the bottom, that's it. You've got a small pool and this weird grinding loop dearly, with no way back to the top without restarting the course. They fixed this in Project 8 by removing the park, but now we've got this dilapidated murder shack surrounded with what looks like a moat of sewage. But at least you can hop over and teleport back to the start of the map. Not totally terrible, but just limiting to play. Let's keep the trend of mysterious and forgotten levels nobody really cares about going with the ruins from the classic modes of American Wasteland and Project 8. This is a small, post-apocalyptic area which resembles a war zone of Hollywood. There is a destroyed parking garage, a big river area with all pipes, and even a massive skyscraper which you can jump off and launch across to an overpass. Well, in American Wasteland it launches you, the broken physics in Project 8 totally balk this jump, so I don't know. This is a mediocre area and doesn't really leave a mark on the franchise. There just isn't a whole lot to do, and of all of the Los Angeles levels we have access to, I think it's best to keep this one hidden in the background. Our next strange and bizarre level is from the PS1 port of Pro Skater 4. Before we look at it, I'd just like to reiterate from my review of this game that to unlock this level, you need to complete every single goal in this game, more than 70 to 80% of which are the same tired high score missions. So, it's a massive chore to do this legit. But for all of your effort, you gain access to Little Big World, where you play as a microscopic germ fooling around on the kitchen counter. Tricking off of the breakfast, grinding matches and toast, but I love doing a Superman off the ledge and into the sink. Thematically, this place is great and it really gives off the same vibe you get from playing the Toy Story levels from Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure, which was released alongside Pro Skater 4 and was built off of its engine. But like so many of these levels, it grows tired very quickly. It's because, for all of these cool objects, none of them link together to make a truly fun course. And for all you need to accomplish to even get here in the first place, it is just not worth the pain.
And keeping on with Pro Skater 4, let's take a look at another guest appearance from the second Matt Hoffman game, Chicago. Now, unlike the Hoffman Factory from earlier, I have not actually played this level in the game it's originally from. But, we're here to talk about how it performs as a Tony Hawk level, and it's average. What can I say? The level is vast, and that's still probably an understatement. I do like the bridge launch and the boat on the river, but the rest of this place just feels really empty, unfortunately. And with the distance to make up here, I can imagine this would work much better on a BMX. There is just no skate terrain to be found anywhere, which means this is one big empty street course. Now, I get the feeling I'm going to upset some people with this next spot. It's time for the zoo in Pro Skater 4. We've recently covered some fun levels that lose a lot of their replay value due to the jokes growing tired and a lack of skateboard stuff to do, and I feel like the zoo is a great example of that. There are plenty of hidden easter eggs with the hippos fucking, monkeys throwing shit at you, and all of the other fun animal shenanigans that take place here, but none of that make it a good skateboarding level. We've got a lot of empty space, with only a few good areas for high combos to rip. It just hasn't been converted into a skate park enough. So while it still stands as an incredibly memorable and mostly enjoyable map, it fits in nicely with the wide and weaker levels we've looked at so far. So I'm sure that some people are upset about that, but I'm also sure that even more people will be upset that I'd place a Pro Skater 5 level above such a classic. But really, when we're looking at things on this massive scale, two levels neighbouring each other really are quite even. While the bunker doesn't have nearly as much personality in its cramped hallways, it does have a lot more to skate with some fun obstacles and even some additional areas that the warehouse, the clear inspiration for this level, didn't include. It isn't much, but it's alright. That's all there really is to it. In at 108, we have a level from Project 8. The first level suburbs is where we get to shag dad's balls, run them up with classic goals, and just get a feel for the game's new mechanics. Skating across the various backyards, we find pools and fountains, fences and ledges, and even some ghetto ramps the local skaters have built. Again, there isn't much to it, but it's alright overall. Moving from the first area of the game to the final area, now we've got the fun park to take a look at. Now this is more exciting with roller coasters to ride and some great combo lines to be found around the park. However, it is quite segmented, meaning you've only got a certain style of tricks to do in one part and then some different tricks in another part. This disco floor, or whatever it is, really only seems to serve the mission goals here, which is unfortunate as it takes up a lot of space. But the level is a decent meeting of silly theming and a strong challenge to close the game out. Time for another sci-fi adventure to skate heaven. This level is actually a compilation of various real-life skate spots. Tony Hawk's Backyard, Wallows, and the Anti-Gravity Death Star which features in the 2X version. Beautiful. Thankfully, unlike the Pro Skater course from Thug 2, these different lonely areas do actually have stuff to skate, which is great to see. And while everything here is incredibly disjointed from itself, at least the location is actually decent to skate and fun to explore. Even the Game Boy Color version accurately portrays the feeling of distance and empty void that you'd expect from a level like this. Another Pro Skater 2 classic, Venice. Now, I'm sorry, but I really don't think this is a great level worthy of appearing as many times as it did across the series, while many other great levels only appeared once or twice. 
Yes, this is another incredibly memorable location thanks to Ollie the Magic Bum, the various rooftop segments and transfer gaps, but the majority of space here is taken up with this wide plaza with next to nothing going on. Not bad, but I really don't understand why this level is held to such high regard. Many of the courses in Ride and Shred were downhill style levels, but Ride also featured some more traditional enclosed areas where you could loop around continuously. Barcelona Plaza shows us that this format can actually be a lot of fun. There are lots of ramps and ledges to grind, fun spots for manuals, and the layout and obstacles give it a nice flow for repeated sessions. Simple levels like this are never going to top the rankings, but sometimes it's nice to just relax on a course like this one. Staying with Ride for a bit, we've got Frankfurt Terminal. The Germany area of this game only features one level, but it's a decent hand, with many varied routes to take through here, accommodating both street and vert styles. The big plane sculpture you can grind does come with some PTSD due to a really wonky mission, but otherwise, the outdoors and big gaps make up for it. Central Park takes a different approach, transforming a typically boring location with some fun playground pieces to work with. I mean, this is worth it just to hear Mike V say, See if you can combo the jellyfish tentacle grind. Yes, it's silly, but it gives this place some character, which it definitely needed, as this is a shorter run than most other levels. And let's end this off with another enclosed area, Loop Plaza in Chicago. It's got lots of walls to skate, ledges and tunnels, with plenty of manual pads and spots to jump off. And with the big glass sculpture as the centerpiece, if only people had given this game more of a chance, they'd have found some rather enjoyable locations like this one. This may not be as big a location as the Barcelona Plaza, but with a greater focus because of this, means we have unlimited opportunities for hitting special tricks. And with that out of the way, we are 65 levels down with exactly 100 more to go. Holy shit. We're not even halfway through yet. How is that even possible? Now, while we still have a way to go before we reach the truly platinum tier levels, we are definitely out of the darkness and finished with the truly awful this series had to offer. So, now that we've had a moment to catch our breath, let's smash through the top 100 Tony Hawk levels, starting off with number 100. The Barracks from Pro Skater 5. If there is one thing this series has a lot of, it's standard skate park courses, and the Barracks, in all of its simplicity, has a nice variety of obstacles. Rails, ledges, kickers and quarter pipes, with a pool in the outdoor area. There isn't a whole lot to do here, but the interior and exterior flow well into each other for long combos, making this a limiting, yet still workable level to skate. Staying with Pro Skater 5 for number 99, we've got the Mega Park. Same scenario, only we have a lot more space and many ramps for launching into the atmosphere. Hopefully not too high though, I don't want to go back to that damn asteroid belt. If it weren't for the hidden sewer location, this level might be lower down the list, but thanks to the additional space, the added personality and variety give it something more than first meets the eye. Okay, our very first entry for Tony Hawk's Proving Ground. Here we have the DC Mall. The two best features here are the large steps that offer a surprising amount of inspiration for tricks, and of course, the large monuments outside the Air and Space Museum. Again, they give this level some added personality to help it stand out from some of the other plaza locations. There are some fun combo lines to hit here, including this weird manual distance challenge which is really fun to master, and the various pools on the ground and rooftops give us plenty of vert terrain, bringing with it many more opportunities to jump off of stuff. Love it. 
Another level from Proving Ground is Downtown Baltimore. This is a play on the more traditional vast street course as the series was known for, compacting everything into a smaller space somewhat to allow for easier transitions between different areas. We've got the theatre with that weird art sculpture and pools with some rooftops thrown in. Actually, there is a lot of vertical space to make up here thanks to being able to climb. It's a decent level, standard procedure really. Back into some more classic Pro Skater with Chicago, which has made a surprising number of appearances across the series, given at such a basic level. An indoor skate park with a half pipe, pool and not a whole lot else. But that really speaks to the quality of developers to be able to squeeze so much content out of it. It's lacking in lines, but still makes for some fun Tony Hawk action. On that note, Burnside, also from the first game, is another incredibly simple skate park setup. This one doesn't get as much love though. I feel like the exterior space underneath this highway with the Neversoft pool give it some more character appeal. But layout wise, there really isn't a whole lot to comment on. But by far one of the best pure skateboard levels in the franchise has to be the Tampa Skate Park which appeared in 2X. This is probably the only good thing to come out of this game. It's a really fun street course indoors with lots of clever objects to work around. Outdoors has a vert area where you can get up onto the roof and perform a loop of death. And shit, you can even find a secret dog, so yeah, this level gets a lot of things absolutely right. But that also does it for 2X. Unfortunately, for what is a decent remaster of the first two games for Xbox, the exclusive content here really hurt the game in the end, with nothing new worth playing to offer, with the sole exception being the Tampa Park you see here. And even this level would go on to see future improvements, but more on that later. Alright, well with another game finished, let's make a start on a new game in Underground, with its first appearance on the list, Hotter Than Hell. This is the level you unlock after completing the story mode, and it takes place in Outback Australia. Accurate name. It's set up like a concert ground with a big stage, and by collecting the letters that spell out KISS, the band members appear and God of Fucking Thunder starts to bring the roof down. Of course, there is no roof on this stage, only a mess of walkways and high wire combo lines to obliterate to the sound of some amazing tunes. There are some ramps around as well, but the majority of this map is occupied with desert to ride around in the buggy. Cool concept when I was 10, but in retrospect, it's really dead air for this level. So while it is a shame that we don't get a larger assortment of skatable terrain here, KISS is still certainly a highlight of the entire franchise. Going backwards again, we get another outdoors festival setup with Carnival from Pro Skater 4. This is a more jokey, silly course with plenty of easter eggs and fun attractions to skate. Roller coasters, ferris wheels, spinning UFOs and even a haunted house. But unlike a lot of the other silly and secret courses the series has to offer, Carnival actually includes a solid list of objectives, which give a lot of this random junk some much needed structure and purpose. Thank you! And of course, it gets even better when Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast starts playing and you're skating around this place as Eddie. It's a shame the band didn't show up to perform though, or we could have had a battle of the bands. Oh well, both of these levels share a similar vibe and work as fun secret levels. Finally, we got some! Let's keep going backwards to go forwards with a Pro Skater 3 level, the Oil Rig. This appeared exclusively in the Xbox version of the game before making a cameo in American Wasteland. I'm much more familiar with this appearance of the map, mostly because we actually get some goals here. Like I just said, secret levels with nothing to do just don't stay with you as much. But for the course itself, it's very vertical with big jumps and drops, lots of rails and pipes for grinding, and elevators to help you get around. 
Navigation is a big problem for this place, and personally, I find it easy to get lost when I play here sometimes. It has a lot of fun spots, but the convoluted layout is its greatest weakness. Let's look at another level that appeared in Wasteland that was originally from Pro Skater, the first Pro Skater, Downtown Minneapolis. I want to open up a discussion here. We've previously seen Streets from Pro Skater, which was a wide street course with very few interesting parts to skate. Well, downtown here is incredibly similar, but it's just so much more memorable with its plaza centerpiece, extensive combo lines that border this area, and then of course, being able to get up onto the roofs and launch across to find a hidden pool. There is still a significant lack of stuff to do, but a lot like Chicago, this level still managed to have the life squeezed out of it for multiple games, so it's definitely a step above the streets course. However, the Tony Hawk series has always found difficulty trying to create fun, sprawling and realistic street maps. So let's go through a couple of them right now, as they're all very similar in terms of quality. At number 89, we've got another San Francisco street course from Pro Skater 4, and it is much better designed than that other level. We've still got the trolley to play around with, the dock areas, some rooftops, and a competition space set up in the middle, so it's got everything you could possibly need. But still, there are only so many ways to hit this place, and a lot of the areas seem designed for specific goals and then go unused, which seems quite wasteful. I always forget this spot behind the tram sheds even exists because there isn't much to do over here. A fun and very memorable location, but still average nonetheless. Then we've got Philadelphia from Pro Skater 2. This place is absolutely massive, spanning both Love Park and all of FDR as a hidden spot. Until you can access this place, Philly is a stark level for skate terrain and yet, somehow, still manages to offer some fun objectives whenever it appears. Get up onto the roof and doing that big grind, working around and inside the fountain. But the real attraction here is the skate park, allowing you to do a big jump in and rack up some much more substantial scores. There are still many more street courses to come up yet, but as you can start to see here, for everything these levels do well, there always seems to be something missing or not thought out well enough. And it's a format of Pro Skater level that really has only been perfected a number of times. Alright, here it is. The first Pro Skater level. The Warehouse. THE Warehouse. We've seen many levels try to recreate the simplistic magic this course brings to the table, but never has it been replicated. And yet, all we have here to skate is a rail, a few ramps, the iconic puddle of water, and of course, the big halfpipe in the middle. But despite its limited terrain, that certainly didn't stop it from appearing many times throughout the series. There isn't much to say beyond that. This one speaks for itself, and still speaks just as loud as it started back in 1999. In for number 86 is The Slums, which appeared only in the 7th gen versions of Project 8. This industrial landscape is actually quite minimal for skate action with some burned out houses in the centre for ramps, a big tall factory to climb and jump off, of course, and then another factory to blow the fuck up, which completely opens up this world. There are a lot of fun challenges to complete here, and some incredibly challenging ones too. The biggest feature though is still the building grinds that contain this area for some nice high spots and combos that then lead on to other areas of the game. So now that that annoying building is out of our way, let's ride around the corner to the town square. This, as usual, is your typical street course with plenty more buildings to climb and find hidden skate spots. But it's the entrance to the school which is featured heavily in objectives. Another good space with many memorable missions that still mostly serves as a gateway to other, better levels out there. Which leads into our next level quite well.
Proving Ground's open world was more spread out with some transitional areas much like American Wasteland. However, unlike American Wasteland, these locations were much more fleshed out with their own objectives and even classic goals. And the first of these we have to look at is the Bay Bridge Tunnel, which connects Philly and the downtown Baltimore location we've already seen. Going down through the tunnel itself is disappointing, but the above shipping area has plenty of grinding combos to master, a big crane to climb up on, and some fun pool areas. So really, what I'm saying is, this place has a lot more to offer than it really needs to for such a small, less important area on an otherwise sprawling map. Yeah, and while we're speaking of sprawling maps, now we've got Atlanta from Tony Hawk's Underground 2 Remix. For a traditional street course, this place is massive. Large parks and plazas filled with sculptures that, on their own, are the size of classic pro skater courses, but then we also have boulevards, many buildings to get up on, and even inside with this interior mall space. And that's without all of the additional street spots with your favourite obstacles just everywhere. There is so much to see in this level, and to see it run flawlessly on a portable system is incredible. The goals themselves are not as full as the level they take place in, but it's still so easy to spend a lot of time here. And with that, we have officially reached the halfway point of the rankings. Wow. Just let that sink in for a moment while we regroup here. We have seen so many bad levels, but we've also started to see many good levels as well. We've also seen a level from every single eligible game. And we've even eliminated some of those games entirely. So before we continue on, be sure to drop a like on this video, subscribe, and maybe even share it with your friends if you think I've earned it. Alright, now that I've had a moment to just compose myself and plug my shit, let's keep shredding through the list with number 82. Whistler Mountain from Tony Hawk Shred. Yeah, we haven't seen this game for a while. Not since position 151 have we seen Shred, so as you can see, a significant contrast in quality here. Whistler Mountain, of course, is a snowboard track, and while this side of the game feels quite slapped on just for something more, the level is actually pretty okay. Of course, I'd much prefer to play it in a Sean Palmer game, but whatever. It has a strong selection of fun obstacles and plenty of big jumps to nail, which is all you really need for a fun snow course. In at 81, we've got the LA River from Ride, another downhill course, of course. This one is actually pretty fun, even with the motion control gimmick. There are plenty of grind opportunities, and the extensive tunnels remind me of a scene from Deck Dogs, an Aussie skateboarding flick with Tony Hawk. I dunno, this is one with really nothing to comment on, but the atmosphere here make it great for cruising through, and it all finishes with a big launch into a jump across a wide gap. Awesome. And now back to Shred, just trading turns here. This time it's wallows, with many split paths to take, little shortcuts, and quite a few set pieces. Both of these are actually quite similar in theme, with the extensive concrete ditches. Wallows definitely lacks the focus of the previous track, but certainly makes up for it with its moments. At one point, even the bloody road is collapsing under your feet. While the previous was a rad cruising map, this one is more like a stunt track with a lot more obstacles and monumental tricks to hit. Just solid downhill levels at this point. Which leads into Rome from Downhill Jam quite nicely. This one starts off in the mountain ruins, snaking down through the various theatres and streets of the city, but the big moment is bursting out above this amazing vista view, with only a single bridge connecting the rest of this course to the final stretch by the beach. It's just so wicked cool. If it weren't for some uncomfortable middle sections, I'd have placed this one much higher for that moment alone. Lots of fun. And to finish up this downhill segment, let's switch over to the DS version of the game for Kilimanjaro, 
another snow course. Hey, back where we started. This time, it's all about big rails and big airs. Man, they must have some bloody big balls to be doing this shit, because you wouldn't catch me up there. One of the finer details I love about this map is that once you run out of snow, you get switched onto a mountain board so that you can continue the action into the rocky cliffs at the bottom of this mountain. If I can have one complaint though, it's gotta be this annoying sharp bend right in the middle of the course. It just ruins your momentum and I always forget it's there, but otherwise, great place to race. Alright, let's check out a Pro Skater 2 classic, New York City. With its park, lower down mall area and raised metro tracks into the hidden spot, it's definitely one of the more vertical levels of the game, with a large variety in locations to see. Sure, the layout for combo lines and such is simplistic, but there are still a lot of great areas to ride, and for an early street course, it definitely performed better than some of the others we've already seen. I must say, I'm surprised this one doesn't get more love, as we never saw it outside of the Pro Skater 2 titles. It's always the same places getting guest appearances and remasters, why not give this one a turn? It's more than deserving. In comparison, the mole from the first game appeared a whole bunch of times, despite being on the same level of quality. I always hated this map when I was younger, but it's grown on me to a certain extent. The large assortment of whopper jumps is what did it, but if this one lacks anything, it's definitely some dedicated skating space. All we really get are a few ramps at the bottom, which just aren't enough. But the huge scale of this place sells the arcade style incredibly well, and still stands as a very memorable and enjoyable location. Jumping forward now 16 years to Pro Skater 5. Yes, this game is still in the race with Wild West. I guess as a sorry we're slimy cunts who only care about cashing in, this game saw some additional maps being added in after this abortion was released, and this happens to be one of them. And who would have thought, it's easily one of the better courses in the game. It's basically a big desert fort, cowboys and Indian style, with tracks for grinding, big pools, and a hidden underground mine to uncover. There are some good places for vert tricks around the buildings, and while it certainly has its issues, because, come on, this is Pro Skater 5 we're talking about, looking past the game's overall quality, in any other Thup's title, this one would be really enjoyable. Time to hit up the tables in the Vegas Casino, which later magically appeared in the East LA area for American Wasteland. Sure, whatever. I mean, if we can believe that a tunnel from East LA can lead onto Alcatraz Island in San Francisco, then why the hell not? Anyway, this casino map is made up of two main areas. The primary floor with your slots, tables, and a whole bunch of other stuff to play around with. And then we have the pool area with the waterfall bar, multiple spine transfers to hit, and a big launcher on either side of the huge gap above this place. A lot of fun. The original remix version also included a VIP room and a secret maintenance area, but they really don't add anything to this place. For what seems like it should go in the pile of all the other silly level concepts the series attempted, this one actually works quite well. Okay, it's time to KO another game from the rankings. In at 73, we have the famous Brooklyn Banks from Tony Hawk Ride. This is another one of those enclosed maps we've seen before, and it's actually a lot of fun. Of course, I wish I could experience it with a real controller in my hand, but this place is not held back by the shoddy controller. There are plenty of grinds and kickers to hit, but it's the neat hidden quarter pipe shack that I really love. It really feels like a skate spot, which I'm sure is thanks to the real world influence. But it just feels like an actual location, whereas many of these feel like video game levels regardless of real world inspiration. So, good job. And the final level from Ride to be featured is the streets of Toledo, Spain. 
With the thick stone architecture and many high ground, low ground routes to take, it's just an incredibly solid downhill stage with plenty of great spots to work with. A strong finish to ride standing through this list. Back to Pro Skater 4, this time to the PS1 port again for the exclusive sewers level. Split into three different rooms connected by hallways, we've got a vert area, a bigger vert area, and an admittedly weak street area. If you can call a fun box with some rails a street area. But don't worry, you'll mostly be using this place to navigate up to the secret passageway. I know it doesn't look like it, but the big airs you can get in this place combined with the more challenging aspect of reaching higher points on the map, make for a great combination. The final competition of the original Pro Skater took place in Roswell, and what a location. Sure, the actual map itself is a basic skate park setup, but it was such an abrupt contrast against all of the other normal levels in the game. We had a hidden bunker with tanks, flying saucers and dinosaur bones, but also a secret laboratory completed with a creepy alien. And unlike many of the other simple parks in this game, Roswell stands out by actually having a neat selection of combo lines to hit, which wasn't a fully realised concept for the first title. Simple done well will always triumph over something complicated of mediocre quality. Now it's time for possibly the most important number on the list. Number 69 goes to Freedom Plaza from Proving Ground. This area has a lot of sweet combo lines, which is awesome, in combination with some pieces that allow you to get up really high. Many major missions take place here too, such as the rigging contest and the film spots with Arto Sari. Just around the corner from here, we can enter the Air and Space Museum, which as you can imagine, is another wild ride in park design. It's got plenty of aircraft and spaceships to play with, large jumps and incredibly high up grinding spots. Fuck, it even has a moon landing room, what an awesome idea. An idea ripped right off The Simpsons, but still, it all makes for a level that's easy to spend a lot of time in, hitting every obstacle with every trick. Staying with Proving Ground, now we have another transitional area that still manages to cram a whole bunch of fun, interesting and memorable objectives into its incredibly compact space, the Harbour Bridge. Again, it's got classic goals, lots of clever distance challenges, and plenty of opportunities for awesome photos and footage. I just love how there is still so much to do in these lesser, unimportant areas of the game. None more so than level number 66, the subway area. More of a shuttle, really, than an extensive network. But who could forget the golden shopping trolley, the alligator, and of course, just launching out of bloody windows to nail tricks. One of the best missions of the entire series takes place here, where we get a list of photos to capture and a time limit. It becomes this super fun and creative scavenger hunt, looking for each spot, setting up your gear, and snapping the shot. Incredibly inventive and a signature moment of Proving Ground's true open world. Alright, and now we're back with Shred for another downhill track. This time it's New Orleans. Not much to really say about this one. It's got plenty of grinding segments with a few big jumps, and it's only let down by appearing in Shred. It's very colourful and has some good obstacles, which is really all you need for a map of this genre. But now we come to the final appearance of Shred, a snowboarding course through the French Alps. You know, I'm honestly surprised this game lasted as long as it did, given it kickstarted this entire list with the worst Tony Hawk level. But it really came back around with some fairly decent and enjoyable downhill maps. The Alps here begins with a huge helicopter launch and a decision between the outside ramps or going through the interior of an icy cavern. Working down through the logging areas, there are many fun obstacles to play with and the pace is incredibly consistent here with a good flow from top to bottom. Shock. 
I am shocked just seeing how vastly different this is in quality to where we started. Despite giving us a lot of bad maps as well, Shred has had a solid run through the rankings, but its time has finally come. Alright, another underground level. This time it's San Diego. I've always had one issue with this map, is that to either side is just a dead end with not much going on. If only it looped back around, it could have been a gold tier stage. But despite that, there is still a lot of fun terrain to mess around with, mostly balconies and ledges. The large amphitheatre doesn't have a whole lot going on, but I always enjoyed the big rail in the centre. A good level that didn't live up to all of its potential. But it still leagues better than the Game Boy Advance version, so that means San Diego has plenty to offer. And right back into Proving Grounds, Baltimore Harbour. This fountain area makes for some solid vert space, with the waterfront adjacent buildings giving us plenty of street stuff to hit. This place includes a lot of really fun and memorable combo lines to master, alongside many of the game's major story beats taking place here too. We spend a lot of time here and grow quite familiar with this area, and it's a good one. What can I say? We've seen how the massive street courses shot themselves in the foot, so getting these more compact ones is a natural step forward and upwards for quality. Just look at Beverly Hills in Wasteland. It's another small street course that surprisingly offers up many great locations for skating. Plenty of roofs to get up on, gap between and launch off, some incredibly tech spots too on ground level, and it all just flows really well together. If anything, I actually do wish there was some more land to cover here just to keep things going. So while the smaller street courses are good, in a way, they're not totally realistic. It's when you look at the much more extensive Tampa level from underground that this becomes much clearer. Everything still has a great flow to it, but we have some more room to play with, ultimately giving it more gameplay. We've got the snake run by the park, the wharf complete with party boat, and of course, the strip club. Don't try to deny it, you spent a lot of time here playing this game, wondering what exactly that police officer was doing with the goat in the alleyway. It's a fun level with a lot of silliness, but still manages to be quite serious at the same time. We also get a handful of interior spots, inside the bank and a fully dedicated skate area spanning two large warehouses. We actually saw this back with level 94. 2X's Tampa Skate Park was recycled here into just one of many locations to visit within this bigger area. And still, we can get up on the roof and find even more to skate, which is why this full street course is so easy to lose yourself in. And back to proving ground once again, just to bookend this street course discussion for the time being. Love Park is another go at an extensive map with plenty to do. High combos, lots of ground level street material to get tech with, and a huge dive to take from the top of a building. There is a lot to get done both on the grand and much simpler scales, with many great missions taking place right here. It's fascinating looking back to the Philadelphia course from Pro Skater 2, where we also had Love Park, and just seeing it totally transformed for this new generation. You can't help but love this place. Number 58, Kona. Unlike a lot of the tiny skate parks in this series, this one is ginormous with a heap of space for both vert and street styles. It's a very impressive looking map and everything is so smooth to transition between. The PS1 version takes place at night time which is interesting, but no matter which variant you're playing, there are limitless possibilities for the lines and scores you can reach. Only thing I hate. That fucking slalom down the snake run. I just hate the shitting thing, it never works. But, love it or hate it, Kona is a memorable course released at a time when the series really hit its stride for solid level design. 
Time for more Underground. This time, it's Underground from Pro Skater 5, another one of the additional maps that, again, show how slack the primary courses were designed. It's a downhill course through a subway that makes Subway from 2X look absolutely pathetic. This is how it's done, lads. Visually, it's depressing with the grey-greenish colour palette, but there are plenty of different ways to navigate down the course and loop continuously if you're talented enough to hold your combo. Its objectives are also good and make use of every element included here, but all of the good work is let down by the overall quality of this game. By the time you get here, you're more than over all the bullshit, so in a way, this is definitely an overlooked map that has something to offer the series. Unfortunately, it was just too late in the lineup. Just like Pro Skater 5, Project 8 is still hanging on, but only by a thread. Let's take a look at the Car Factory, the real Car Factory map. We saw the 6th gen version way back at position 146, so as you can judge from that, this much more compact industrial setting is significantly more enjoyable to skate. Rather than having a series of rooms connected with unworkable corridors, we've now got a single construction line with some super crazy combos to hit and plenty of space for vert in the pipes down below. You can get a full head of steam and launch into a continuous session that will lead you all the way back around so you can loop the entire thing again, or shoot you out into a different area of the map to keep the line going. And with the mess of walkways and safety rails, we've got our hands on even more distance challenges, with everything here being skatable. What I'm wondering though, is why this wasn't included in the downgraded port. It's a much smaller map compared to the behemoth in that version, so what system limitations were holding this one back? Oh well, we got the car factory in its truest form right here, and it's highly addicting. Another great location from Project 8 is the high school that comes with plenty of beaver but also a great mix of skate terrain as well. The gymnasium and pool, a classic, plenty of benches and ledges for grinds and manuals, and a huge rooftop gap to nail. But its most notable feature, I'd say, is the piano that covers a walkway, which when grinded, plays this delightful tune. If that doesn't perfectly complete this segment, I don't know what can. Back a few steps to Remix and Wasteland's Classic Mode, here we have Santa Cruz, the surfer map with a lot to offer. After being hit with some wild weather, the beachfront space is littered with driftwood to grind, while heading out over the water leads to a secret halfpipe on a small boat. There are plenty of buildings, plazas, arcades, and even a hidden boardwalk area with park rides that give us a lot of potential. The destroyed building is a great place to start a combo, and we even get some dedicated skate spots with both some street and vert obstacles. This place has everything, and it makes for a really great all-rounder map to cater for every skater. Alright, let's knock out a few more American Wasteland levels. Up next is the Skate Ranch, the primary focus of the entire game. We scan LA for as many cool objects as we can, and dump them all here to create American Wasteland on the famous Green Pipes Point Snake Run. So we have a lot of really distinct and memorable set pieces here. The T-Rex ramps, various buildings we've demolished, huge electrified pyramids, and a crazy launcher off the remains of the Hollywood sign. It's just such a great looking park. But if there is one downside to this place, it's that it really feels like a bunch of random shit thrown together, and certain aspects feel either slapped in to fill out the space, or just don't work too great alongside other parts. So, in short, it lacks many strong combo lines to hit. But despite this, it allows you to make use of all of the skills you've learned throughout the game, and combined them all into one of the most incredible spots of the entire franchise. 
Next on the chopping block is East LA, which has had a few mentions already. Notably, this is a very narrow area with a lot more vertical space to cover. Go up over the bridge for some cool grinds or down below to grab a huge air out of the drainage ditch. The street area has some roofs and interesting gaps to land, completed with a ghetto park to perform some bigger moves in. And now, onto the very first level of wasteland, we have Hollywood. Several theatres to visit and jump off, the old shack and even the Hollywood sign. Well, before we blow it up and steal it for the ranch. Shit, even that damn goat is here. This is quite a simple area with many great landmarks along with a decent selection of more technical areas that force you to think outside the box on how you skate them, which is what a good Tony Hawk level should do. And to that point, we're here. We've reached the top 50 Tony Hawk levels and as you can see, already made a start on the gold class. Everything from this point on, you can't really go wrong with, so it's going to be extra difficult ranking all of these. So quickly pause the video, run to the toilet and refill on your snacks, do what you need to do, because we've got a lot of momentum launching into level 50. The Zone from Pro Skater 3's Game Boy Advance port. Yeah, by far one of the best and most creative secret levels the series ever saw, and it's exclusive to the GBA, who would have thought? When you first access the zone, you can't really do much, but continuing to beat the game with more and more characters, you start to open up this map's full potential. Anti-gravity, speed boosters and rails that change your path. So coming back to the zone full force with all of these extras turned on totally transforms it into an insanely addicting landscape, perfect for arcade-like mayhem. Holy shit, we are definitely into the upper echelon now. And when you look back at the Zone 2 in Pro Skater 4's GBA port, and how pathetic that was back at 137, only cements the original's quality even further. Back to the original Pro Skater, still in the race despite the simplistic designs. The original school level is actually one of the larger maps to come out of the game, with a super fun street course looping around to the vert area by the swimming pools. You can get up on the roof and break into the gymnasium too. What is it with all of the school courses in this series? They love to do that stuff. Anyway, a very simple one that is still incredibly fun and extra competitive in multiplayer which is thanks to the lack of significant lines for scoring big. So from that, let's graduate to college in Pro Skater 4, which features a lot of the same concepts with some additional street space surrounding the Central Park area. Our introduction to the Free Skate format for career mode, while its objectives are relatively simple, they're all still very memorable and the various high spots here really complete the location perfectly. There are not too many levels out there with whopper airs to make like this one, so it stands out for that reason. Ending off career mode in Pro Skater 2, the final competition takes place in the Bull Ring. Now to a casual player, it may seem like a fun, silly location, but no. This is based off of a real park built where Tony Hawk first nailed the full loop. Pretty cool to see it in the game, but remember, we're looking at how these levels work as video game levels, and yeah, this one is still a lot of fun. Very small with limited obstacles, so it's up to the player to figure out how to get the most out of this place. Personally, I open my runs with the loop, followed by getting up on that high wire grind, and if I'm feeling a little cheeky, I'll see what that bull is up to charging down below. Quite a radical level to end a radical game. Really, from start to finish, Thups 2 is a classic, no doubt about it. The hangar which opens up the game has appeared many times throughout the series as a result of this, a total of 7 different times, meaning that this one ties for the most appearances of a level alongside 3 others which are still yet to come. 
Can you guess what they are? And yet, for another simple course, it never fails to disappoint, no matter which game it appears in. The big roll into the iconic halfpipe, smashing through windows and launching a helicopter to reveal a hidden outside area. There is so much interactivity here that even the portable versions of this game included, which is great to see. Man, Thug 2. We haven't seen this in a long time. Unlike the weak end to the story mode with the trifecta cluster that was Pro Skater, classic modes finale, the triangle, is way better. With plenty more of that awesome interactivity I mentioned, combined with great attention to long continuous combo lines and many significant landmarks. This is like the Roswell level on Super Steroids, with the amount of hidden easter eggs and details crammed in here. Man, this is a fun one, and that's what you want for a final secret level. Something that rewards you for putting the time in to reach it. And the triangle certainly meets those criteria. It's the tits. Alright, American Wasteland is on its last legs here, with the downtown area. The size of the lines and jumps here are huge, with places to launch and big drops, lots of grinds and these awesome tunnels to combo through. We learn focus from Master Zen and, of course, epic destruction that adds additional big ramps and drops to make. A simple yet solid area for the map overall. Switching over to the classic mode and remix, of course, we've got Kyoto, which is yet another great street environment to play with. In two parts, the large interior space has these great escalators which launch you into some amazing grind lines and high spots, while the outdoor streets offer more traditional obstacles to work with. There is a skate park and some tall buildings to climb, but the icing on top is a big giant monster battle that destroys half the map, leading to even more chaotic skating terrain. If you've played Thug Pro online, then you know this is a popular choice, and it's very clear to see why. For number 42, we've got The Shipyard, an iconic map from Pro Skater 4, and one that I'm honestly surprised we never saw remastered or recycled at any point. In fact, most of the Pro Skater 4 maps stand only in their original game, which is sad. Anyway, the shipyard has a lot of terrain that you need to master before you can get good at this level. Many complicated combo lines, gaps, and interesting obstacles and hazards that require thinking outside of the box to do some cool stuff with. The PS1 version also has this huge tube you need to scale while grinding that definitely takes some skill to finally land. But once you've got the feel for it, then it's always a highly enjoyable level to return to. Another map I'm surprised never got the recycle job was Skate Street, a bloody wicked competition level. Big vert terrain to play with and some additional outdoors areas. I love getting up on that big wall and grinding the top, along the ceiling and dropping down to the ramps below. And despite mostly being ramps, quarter pipes and pools, linking tricks between them is so common for this place and make it something to master. It's so good. Why was this overlooked in favour of redoing the mall or the warehouse so many times? I know they're great classic locations, but so is this. Marseille, on the other hand, appeared a few times outside of Pro Skater 2, in the HD remake, and even the classic mode in Project 8. Weird, but always welcome. I think it's safe to assume we all start our runs by launching up this building to grind the roof before we begin scoring in the bowl area. But I usually leave that for the end of my run and grind around the outside instead, looping all the way back around to the street section where we begin. But holy shit, the first time I discovered that hidden area, man, I thought I was some kind of video game god. It's so subtle, making it well hidden, yet still quite simple to figure out. I mean, why else would there be a weird plank of wood here? And while the hidden area is mostly just for gapping the fountain in the center, it's yet another highly memorable and fun level for the series. And while we're on the topic of competition levels, let's check out Rio from Pro Skater 3. 
Lots of cool transition stuff in the middle, a secret pool, and in the PS1 version, you've even got some buildings to climb. But come on, we all know that none of that matters here. We all pick the method of running the long continuous combo loop that borders this place and not touching anything else. Grind, grind, grind. It's a lot of fun, but honestly, does take away from everything else here. The park itself actually has some cool elements to it, but oh well. Whether you favour the easy combo line or not, which majority of you obviously do, Rio is a lot of fun and, for the third time in a row now, makes you wonder why we never saw it outside of Thups 3. From the first competition to one of the first really properly good secret unlockable courses of the series, the cruise ship. What a great idea for a level that shows its value through all of the additional objectives. Hot babes to impress, passengers to throw overboard, and some crazy big scores to meet while skating all over, rampaging and destroying everything in sight. It also happens to include some of the best commentary of any pro skater map, with the captain giving you updates about the cruise while you play. Not until you destroy all of the windows in the greenhouse does the real captain break out of captivity and regain control of the ship. You, yes, you skater down there. You have shattered the glass and set me free. From the fiery depths I have returned, the true Captain Jennings. That imposter will not be bothering us anymore. What? That was a thing happening on this boat and we didn't even know before we got on board? It's crazy to think that this place would have such an involved background story, but that's what makes it the perfect end to one of the best-selling games, not just from this series, but of all time. Now, I mentioned at the start of this ranking that if reused locations were greatly altered, that they would be unique and eligible for their own spot on the list. We've seen that a couple times already with the car factory and Tampa levels, but let's face the facts here. This rule is in place for training from Underground 2. Taking such a basic course like the warehouse and transforming it with a totally new area and so many more opportunities for large combos is what puts this on a whole other level. I couldn't think of a better place to get started with Thug 2, learning the ropes, but it's not just a tutorial area either. Classic Mode blows the original warehouse completely out of the water with some super fun objectives that stand to show how far this series has come in just a few years. This is why we play Pro Skater, because the games continue to make improvements and get better for many years. However, nothing can top the original. Coming in at number 36, we have the final level in our rankings from the original Pro Skater. And of course, it's Downhill Jam. Appearing seven times, tied for one of the most revisited locations next to the hangar, despite its simple layout, we saw so much out of it through the years. It's weird to think that downhill maps were never viewed as fondly as the rest, yet this one definitely received the love it deserved. From Pro Skater through Thug 2 and Project 8's Classic Mode, Downhill Jam on DS with some extra additions, and appearing for the final time in Pro Skater HD with some awesome visuals. Downhill Jam has had an incredibly strong lifespan thanks to its big airs and grinds. Not to mention that secret tape hidden way up high and for allowing us to destroy this entire dam on the way down. Truly a classic, just like its original game. It's 20 years later, and yet, here we are still talking about Downhill Jam and Pro Skater. But not anymore. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater is officially done for these rankings. If it weren't for the success of Downhill Jam, we may never have seen some of the more advanced maps of a similar style in the game Downhill Jam.
I'm talking about Edenborough, with its impressive castles and deep street sections, finished off with a run through the catacombs. This place features many different paths to take and secret shortcuts everywhere, all leading to some breathtaking leaps of faith and memorable combo lines across the rooftops down through the snaking streets. Another great downhill jam map is the Alps, where we begin up in the mountains, tricking through the icy tunnels before eventually reaching the ski resort. Big, huge, gigantic, super-sized airs and grinds to be done here, which is always a blast. The course eventually makes it down to some more rocky terrain, similar to Kilimanjaro from the DS version of the game, then through some ruins and into a small town at the bottom, which requires some sharp navigation to complete quickly. But there is still one more mountain course that trumps it, creatively named Mountain from Pro Skater 5. Yes, a Pro Skater 5 course survived to spot 33 out of 165. I'm sure some of you are livid at that decision, but yeah, too bad for you because this level is far from bad. It takes place in a steep town slash resort with lots of chairlift wires to grind, several flat areas for some more down-to-earth skating, and when you reach the bottom, you can find a few spots that send you directly back to the top so that you can continue some amazing combo lines. This has everything a great downhill track needs to include, and it does all of them really well. What can you say? It's a very good level from one of the very worst games in the series, so... I guess it wasn't all for nothing. Bart Mountain also marks the end of Pro Skater 5 in the rankings. And despite the vast amount of mediocrity and several appearances early on, if only some of these locations were featured in other, better games in the franchise, then maybe people would have a much greater appreciation for those that deserve it. Man, I can't believe we're still going here. This has been a job, let me tell you. But we're almost there. We're almost there. Level 32 is Van Skate Park from American Wasteland. The final level of American Wasteland to be featured. Yeah, knocking out two in a row here. As a dedicated space that is not stripped of its best features throughout the course of the story, this is by far the best map in the game. Plenty of street and vert to play with, the balcony area with easily one of the most difficult gaps of the entire franchise. It's a competition space that offers plenty of great items to work around and some incredible combo lines to discover. Welcome to Suburbia, a newly developed area where you have this mansion right next to a trailer park and where the thin man welcomes you into his horrific backyard. Fucking hell, what a map. Every spot links into the others, which is great for high scoring combos. One minute you're exploring the construction site, and next, you're grinding over to the roof to fix the satellite dish. Oh, and that ice cream truck? I hate that guy. That's when you pop in the PS1 version and flatten his ass. Boom! Take that, motherfucker! It seems to be a trend for the Pro Skater 3 levels. Why did we never see this one again? Well, we did, in Underground 2's GBA port. But why are so many of these awesome levels left behind? It's a damn shame. Jumping forward a few generations, let's check out the Lansdowne course for number 30. A big concrete park with lots of transition space and places to hit big tricks. There is also a street area that leads into combos as you loop the ditch back around up to the top of this place. The DS version also has an additional area towards the back that feels somewhat disjointed, so let's just ignore that. The layout overall begs for vertical manoeuvres, which is something Proving Ground maps don't tend to have enough of, with a lot more focus closer to the ground. So ultimately, it gives this place some identity within the large, sprawling open world. Project 8 also included a concrete park for its open world too, and again, has a great emphasis on large airs. That said, it's all about how you use the landscape to your advantage and how inventive you can get, which is the key to unlocking this place. Many ramps, ledges, pads and pipes to play with. It's a really fun spot, 
But the sixth generation version of this level found in the terrible port is actually better. Yeah, who would have thought? This version is identical, but also features an entirely new section as big as the original area, doubling the amount of stuff we've got to work with. This construction area has a lot of big wild ramps and pipes, lots of stuff to grind, and big bunkers for vert skaters. It's incredible! This version is, of course, let down by appearing in a shitty port with less than impressive physics and control but the course itself is significantly more appealing. Still, no matter what version of the Crete Park you're playing, there is always a lot to do. But with this, it's time to retire Project 8 from the list. A decent run for a decent game that was unfortunately dealt an awkward hand across its generational differences. Anyway, back to Proving Ground, the intro to this game takes place in Inner Philly, and for a smaller street course, this one has a large variety of obstacles. The classic rooftops, elevated train tracks, then a construction site, urban obstacles, and front porches to grind. This place has a lot of character and is perfect for super high scores with enough depth that you can also find plenty of locations for more technical advanced stuff as well. But our final stop for this game is FDR. Of course, based on a real skate park, much like we saw with Love Park earlier, it's interesting to see this HD-ified version in comparison to Pro Skater 2's we saw back at number 88. This is such a great location for all styles of skating. It's got the big cement walls and bowls for transitions, with lots of exterior lines that suit the street style better. And these feed back into the main area, so you get a nice mix between them. Even the Philly level from the previous spot leads into this place, so that you can keep big combos going. This is pure skateboarding area, and remaining focused on that is what makes it so good. But that does it for Proving Ground, a misunderstood entry and the last truly good Tony Hawk game before the ride motion control experiment. And it really doesn't have a bad area either, as it didn't appear prior to the top 100 levels, making this one of the strongest compilations of levels the series has ever seen. Time to go underground with Vancouver. Man, this is a really cool map. You've got this extravagant hotel up top, and down below is the hockey rink, of course. And it's surrounded with nice plaza fountains, flat space for flatland tricks, and the big entrance to the stadium. Combo lines that shoot you into the hotel, shoot you out the other side, climbing up onto the roof of this thing, and hitting the big spine transfers all over the place. Honestly, the only thing that blows about this level is the leaf blower missions, but otherwise, this spot is perfect for high scores, great lines, and going until you can go no more. Staying in Canada, let's check out Canada. Not the classic version you remember, but its downgraded 5th generation counterpart. Yeah, while the primary skate park location remains the same, the iconic woodland area in this version is totally different. We can blow up trees with dynamite, grind through buildings, and even hop across the roofs and balconies that fill in the dead zone out of bounds. It's definitely still a lot of fun, but it does lack the character and sense of humour that really completes this map. From Canada to the West Coast, it's time for San Francisco, a popular destination for the franchise, but this is by far its most accurate and thrilling addition. From Downhill Jam, we start off in the steep slopes, winding our way down into the city streets to hit big airs and long continuous combos. The finale is a rush through Chinatown to complete a very strong downhill map. Easily one of the best the series ever produced. So many opportunities for speed and quick shortcuts that let you dart ahead of the competition. What a wild ride, but there are still some that can top it. Just barely. 
Hong Kong, also from Downhill Jam, starts off with this super cool rail section that lets you grind continuously for as long as you can hold your balance, which if you can, means infinite speed boosts. Once you hit the streets, then you can start drifting down through the narrow, cluttered hallway-like roads, wall plant and fly back in the opposite direction. It's so much fun crashing through this nighttime neon cityscape and is probably one of the few really good-looking night levels we ever saw. The ending takes you down to the Docklands to combo across some ships to the finish line, which brings us to the finish line for Downhill Jam. Level number 21 is Rio. By far one of the best downhill maps, which is interesting, because we've seen a downhill map set in Rio before that doesn't even come close to the quality of this one. It starts up higher than Christ himself as you launch down the narrow walkways into the city area, sneaking through the tiny streets and out through the favelas. There are so many split paths to take here that it's almost hard to even keep up with them while you're racing through. The original DS version also included a stadium towards the end with a big circular grind and a neat skybox shortcut up above. Wicked cool. And that does it for Downhill Jam, another game with an incredibly strong showing through these rankings. We've reached that point in the video now as we prepare for the top 20 levels where we're going to see many of these great games retired in rapid succession. But at the same time, this is the platinum tier of Tony Hawk levels, so it's going to be an incredibly close race. Which game and which map have what it takes to grab the top spot? There are only five main games left in the rankings along with their various ports. So place your bets now as we make a start into the perfection of the Pro Skater franchise. Number 20 is... The Airport from Pro Skater 3 the best downhill style map for the entire series, and I'd say it's hard to argue that. Which is why this level is one of those tied for most appearances with seven, next to the hangar and downhill jam. There is only one other level that appeared seven times, and it's also from Pro Skater 3. Take a guess which one it is. But for Airport, what makes this course so addicting is nailing those high grind lines because the floor is lava. Can you get from top to bottom without touching it? The escalators make for great launching pads and it's so much fun leaping over the secret helicopter and navigating security checkpoints in the gnarliest method possible. And once you reach the bottom and return the lost tickets to your buddy, stopped all of the pickpockets and visited 10 countries, you're free to hit even longer grind combos and big airs off of the tall ramps. For what it may lack in limited obstacles in certain spots, it more than makes up for it with memorable objectives, themes, and just being a fucking good level. Heading inside the Vancouver Stadium, we can find Slam City Jam, the biggest skate contest the Tony Hawk series ever hosted. It's the battle between the player and Eric Sparrow to see who truly is the best new pro skater. It's got an extensive street area which is great for combos, the big half pipe that puts you in position to lip trick on the speakers, but one of the coolest parts of this map is shooting out of the bleachers into a hot new combo. Hell, you can even combo the glass around the outside and loop the level over and over again. Definitely a contender for one of the best dedicated skate park courses of the franchise. But are there any that can top it? We'll have to wait and find out. Hopping across the pond now, welcome to London, chaps. Pro Skater 4 gives us a sprawling plaza area surrounded by high lines and important looking buildings, which do prove to be incredibly important for doing sick tricks. Whoa! Clearly we're in South Bank as that famous spot is tucked away down here for a flatland contest with the entire riverside area making for great lines that loop you back up to the main square. There are lots of 
classic missions here too, like capturing Stompy the Elephant, tagging the Double Deckers, and racing the coppers around the street course. It's like I keep saying, you can have a really solid map, but it's the characters and personality that propel them to a whole new level. And I think this is one location that perfectly captures that. For 17, we're in the tropics of Hawaii, brah, scoring out over the water and trying to score by the poolside area. Venturing into town, we've got ditches to skate, a hidden wallows area which is great for combos, and even has its own hidden area within the hidden area. I thought I was a Tony Hawk genius when I found this halfpipe as a kid. And we're still not finished with the tour here. Now we've got some huge spines to hit, literally launching over buildings that still doesn't even compare to possibly the biggest story moment of the entire franchise. The Holy Hotel Hop. Yeah, let's just jump over a police helicopter and get shipped home in a coffee can. Great idea for a vacation. It's still amazing though, and it's moments like this that Underground's introduction of narrative-driven objectives help to make locations like Hawaii some of the best. From one beachside to another, time to fly down under, mates, because this is prime continuous combo land. Now I know what you're probably thinking, Jack is being incredibly biased here, saving his hometown for one of the highest positions on the list. But no, I promise, this level is so good and naturally takes you to every corner of the map while you're skating. It's got high spots, low tech spots, and even a zoo enclosure for the go-kart riding aboriginal. You fucking racist. It also happens to feature more destruction than any of the other maps in this game, swinging Kenny the Koala's face around like a wrecking ball. This is such a fun map to play, and it's so fluid for getting high scores, which makes it great for competitive play. So whack a shrimp on the barbie, you fucking racists, and join me with a wild rotisserie air over the big building gap to celebrate such a quality level. And here we are back in Canada. The real Canada this time. The skate park area offers plenty of good items to work with and skate around in, but I think it's the woodland area most people remember. Launching by the tree to bury the bully and grinding around the horn, and that super wide quarter pipe that stretches all the way around. Following the walkways and logs down to the back is where you find the switch to access the hidden area. Just ignore the bloke pissing off the side. This half pipe leads onto some destroyed mine tracks that carry you back around to the starting area. I mean, what can I say beyond that? If you're watching this video, let alone made it this far, I'm sure you're aware what makes it so fun. Just the alter ego terrain of clean and safe skate park versus unpredictable rough and tough woods just really works, and all of the character on display here give it a lot of memorable qualities few levels got right. Staying with Pro Skater 3, did you guess correctly? Los Angeles is once again tied for the most revisited location of the series at 7. It's an absolute classic, big street course as well, and for one of the earlier efforts, they definitely got it right. Of course, its best feature is the big earthquake that allows you to get up onto the destroyed freeway, thwart a car chase and jump across the theatre rooftops to collect the hidden tape. But there are so many other great spots here as well that don't get enough attention in my opinion. The big half-pipe transfers by the fountain is one of my go-to places for some vert action, while in the 5th gen version, we get a super long grind from the top of a tower to start some awesome combos. You can do a four-corner challenge here too, hitting each corner of the map in a single continuous line, and launching off the fire truck to get some great vertical distance is challenging to master the timing for, but so satisfying to nail. Even the Game Boy Advance version has a new spin on things with a little movie set area. How cool is that? All of this makes Los Angeles the poster boy level for Pro Skater, and it's rightfully deserved. 
By the time Thug 2 rolled around, these street courses were perfected with levels like Berlin, another location with a lot of high grind combos, chaining down to the ground and then back up again. One of my favourite aspects here is the big launcher that shoots you between the two rooftops for some crazy air tricks. In the building below is the Space Monkey Factory, which includes some more obscure, arty obstacles, while the church provides both a good vantage point for the rest of the map, along with a high spot to dive off. Solid design and personality all around for this one. Similarly, Boston is another strong environment that is admittedly less complicated, but still has a lot of good stuff to work with. The Tea Party ship, spine transfers through buildings with that damn goat again, he's back! Quick shoot through the library and out to the hospital where you can get up on the roof and access the hidden ramps. It's also our first taste of destruction, blowing up the construction site with some cannons to create even more skatable terrain. It's just a lot of fun, no matter which version you're playing, and returning for classic goals opens the level up even more for potential high scoring sessions. And now, just missing out on the top 10, coming in at number 11 is the final Pro Skater 4 map to make the list, Alcatraz Island. This place is easy to find, just go through the tunnel in East LA, remember? The scale of this map is impressive in the primary version, with the extended giant skate area, hill section perfect for shopping carts, the big loop out onto the ocean platform, and of course, the cell block. Man, it's so creepy in here, and getting up onto the roof to meet an escapee is also a lot of fun. Then taking the complicated route from here all the way down through the bombed building and to the ferry to escape Alcatraz. I always loved how this place looks held together with just random bits of pipe all over the place, as if it was split down the middle. The entire thing is an amazing real world location transformed into a highly versatile skate park filled with so many great and classic missions I can't even begin to name them all. And as sad as I am to see Pro Skater 4 finished for the rankings, I must admit, I am very excited that we're finally in the home stretch. Here we are people, the top 10 Tony Hawk's Pro Skater levels. <laughs> we made it, I'm shocked. These levels just kept going and going and going. It seemed never ending a few times, but now that we're finally here, we have only four games left. Pro Skater 2, Pro Skater 3, Underground and Underground 2. Which of these games will take the top spot? Honestly, at this point, these could appear in any order, as they're all worthy of it in my opinion. Remember to drop a like on the video and share it with your friends, because it's time for number 10. The final entry from Pro Skater 2, School 2. We saw the butchered version of this in Pro Skater 5 way back at spot 115, so if that doesn't showcase how much they fucked this awesome level up, I don't know what can. Anyway, School 2, for all of its simplicity, still manages to offer a solid selection of lines, memorable and fun gaps, and some hidden areas that are tough to beat. The gymnasium and pool were copied by just about every school location since, and TC's roof gap even appeared in a few other spots as well. The roll call rails unlocked the secrets of the map and all lead into their own combo lines, but it's the big kicker over the roof into the back section that just never gets old, landing and then immediately hitting that staircase just to launch back over the wall into the main area. It's so satisfying no matter which version of the map you're playing. Truly an iconic course and one definitely worthy of appearing in the top 10. Number 9 is the finale of Thug 2, Skatopia. 
Man, what a crazy cool landscape to end off this jackass fuel destruction tour. It's got so much character, with the rugged makeshift ramps, dirt hill sections, wild animals bloody mauling you while you're trying to skate, as well as several big launches into some whopper lines. And yet, somehow, despite the chaotic layout and nature of this environment, there is plenty of solid skate action to be found here. Long snake runs for manuals, the large vert section at the top, and the various big spines and pulls to hit. And to top it all off, we blow the fucking thing up as the grand finale, and really, what a grand finale worthy of that description. Skatopia is such a lively, enjoyable level that it's easy to waste away hours exploring. Up next is Skater Island from Pro Skater 3, which is yet another solid location of dedicated skating obstacles. It's got vert and street area with lots of fun lines and methods to traverse this place, and grinding the pirate flag of course opens an exterior spot which includes a pirate ship. There isn't a whole lot to do out here, but it's such a cool feature. You can even see the cruise ship off in the distance. This isn't included in the 5th gen version, but we got some cool extensions to make up for it, which is neat. What upsets me though is that the real park this is based off was destroyed only a couple of years after it appeared in Thups 3. I can only assume this is why we never saw this amazing level respawn in any of the other games. But really, what better reason to have it appear again than in tribute to the destroyed real world version? It is such a shame that this level is locked away to Pro Skater 3 because it just has such an enjoyable layout few other locations can match. Let's keep shredding through these top levels. But in Moscow, Russia, the levels shred you. Underground's final stop takes us to the Kremlin. Not to observe like snotty tourists, but to skate. And this is one of the best skate locations, full of sick, crazy lines, big airs, and many unique landmarks unlike any others we've seen before. And tanks. Lots of tanks. Guys, we can't skate now. Look at all these tanks. Even if you're just cruising around this place, it's hard to slow down and stop because you just want to keep hitting big moves. Over the walls, climb to the bell tower, and then escaping Moscow before you're locked away in a gulag or some shit. Moscow is just an awesome location for many memorable and enjoyable moments of the series that also never fails in the gameplay department. From the freezing snow to the sweltering heat of Barcelona. You know, originally, I had this one placed a lot lower. It's a solid map, but nothing really stood out to me at first. But the more I thought about it, this place actually has a vast selection of great areas for skating. We've got a plaza with spine transfers and lots of grinds, Park Guell, which is gorgeous and has plenty of room for big airs, especially when you incorporate the fan booster. The bridge offers a great point to combo across the water to find even more spots, and the cable car is a challenging grind that takes you from one side to the other with limitless areas to launch off for a huge score. And that's only the half of it. Throw in on top of that the sheer volume of character, storytelling, and just arcade style fun that can be had here. Barcelona is an amazing spot that has so much to do and never grows tired. So yeah, this one absolutely deserves its praise. But there are only five spots left, and with only three more games to pick from, it's unfortunately time to eliminate one more. In at number five is The Foundry, by far my selection for most underrated level of the entire series, despite opening one of its best received games. How did this one never get a single appearance outside of Pro Skater 3? That's criminal! The Foundry as an industrial space offers so many creative and cool elements to work with. You've got machines that are constantly in motion, big pits to jump over or stay in for scores, 
The Molten Bucket and Foreman Dunk introduced us to the interactivity that would go on to define many games after this, and various walkways that lead to high up hidden areas are so incredible to uncover and link in with the rest of your combos. Even on Game Boy Advance, this level is just a league above the rest, and its free-flowing nature allows you to loop this place continuously as long as you can hold your balance. I'm totally gutted that we never saw this reappear in a classic mode or reimagined like the warehouse in Thug 2, because this place absolutely does not get the praise it deserves, not only for kicking off the next and strongest generation of the franchise, but also for defining Pro Skater's theme of Skate Everything. And now, the final level from Pro Skater 3, its final competition level, Tokyo. What can I say here? This one is pure magic, like a Rodney Mullen handstand to Primo. You never get tired of seeing it in action. And look at this place, how cool is it? The neon nightlife, two massive loops in the center, and an incredibly tight, solid mix of vert and street combined into an amazing competition area. You know, as a kid, I actually despised this one because I sucked at the game and couldn't place in the competition. So I must admit that in my maturity, it has definitely grown on me as a level that still offers a solid challenge and has so many different ways to maneuver it. As for the secret area here, it's possibly the most cryptic, yet most rewarding of any of these 165 levels. It's just so awesome and it never gets old skating this place, which really is the mark of a truly great level. Especially when you can take that and downgrade it for weak portable systems and still get the same results. As always, I'm shocked and depressed we never saw it appear outside of this game. But that also means we're down to only three more levels, and only two more games. Number three goes to New Orleans from Underground 2, the final level we have to check out from this game as well. I've talked extensively numerous times throughout ranking all of these levels about the quality of street courses, all leading up to this main event. New Orleans features all of the best aspects of any street course the series had to offer, with plenty of rooftop stuff, big airs and spines, launches, down on the ground we have some interesting tech pieces to work with, and a list of cool spots. The church, the cemetery, I always loved sticker slapping the boat back to shore and continuing my combo. And for its destruction sequence, another strong serving of dumb, silly, and really fun stuff with the Voodoo Doctor and a dive into hell. All of this makes for a very competitive multiplayer map as well, and with Thug 2 being the peak of in-game mechanics, this is a strong, strong end to Underground 2's quality run through this video. But that means our final two levels come from Tony Hawk's Underground, the sole survivor. Let's check them out. In at number two is New Jersey. We start our adventure here, learning the ropes of off-board action, before quickly hitting a caveman back on to skate one of the best laid out courses in Tony Hawk history. Long, technical and highly addicting lines from the ground, up onto power lines, down around the schoolyard, onto roofs, across the bridge, into the train station, and back across again. Ah! This is fucking sweet. We can dumpster dive, gap across the houses and the numerous spots all combine together and gel so perfectly that really, the only way I can do this one justice is to shut my mouth and let it play. So here we are, the number one spot, the best Tony Hawk's Pro Skater level of the entire franchise. 
thank you all so much for joining me on this massive retrospective through one of my personal favourite series of all time, to both celebrate its 20th anniversary and to end Year 3 of the Tony October Channel Special. We've seen the lowest of lows, so now it's finally time for the highest of highs. The number one spot goes to... Manhattan from Tony Hawk's Underground. Yes, this had to be the winner. Of all of the broad and narrow street courses we've seen over the years, none do it better than this one. With an impressively extensive list of skate spots combined in with so many different ways to navigate between them that makes nailing the longest combo lines and higher scores possible. The waterfront area has a lot of rails and ledges for grinding, which includes the really cool waterfront grind where we learn the Moonwalk 5.0 from Chad Musker and eventually ditch the old beat up car. It's the best place to launch up onto the freeway and make your way around to the Brooklyn Banks area, which includes a great selection of items for continuous loops of the spot or to send you off into the next one. We get to skate the memorial area with some fun ledges and a pool, or go up to the plaza and link back into a new area down below, either the construction site, the alleyway, or the adjacent buildings. This big glass place is a lot of fun to grind along and also works as a spot for some big vert tricks. And of course, going into the tower in the centre, we can find several spots to trick and grind our way up, up and out, smashing out of a window and nailing a huge trick down to the ground below and continuing our huge line for an even bigger score. It's crazy and it all flows so well. There isn't a single scrap of space on this map that isn't skatable and everything feels connected and real, meaning that even if you miss your mark, you can very easily stumble into a new path to continue hitting tricks. Neversoft's prowess for building both realistically inspired locations and turning them into skater heaven is showcased expertly here. And whether you're a fan of big, stupid high spots or small and technically impressive sets of manoeuvres, there is something for everyone in the Big Apple. And that's why, without a doubt in my mind, this is the best Tony Hawk level. Man, what an astonishing level of quality to end these rankings, and holy shit, what a goddamn crazy marathon of skateboarding action. This was so much fun to work on. A lot of work, yes, but I enjoyed every moment of it, and I can't wait to make more of these videos in the future. But for now, I think I'm finished. Thank you all so much for tuning in and supporting Year 3 of the Tony Hawk Tober Channel Special, and a special thanks to everyone who helped to fund this event via pledging on Patreon or by picking up some of our new merch. Mad love to all of you guys, thank you all so much. If you think I've earned it, then definitely hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for more Square Eye Jack content. And remember to share this video with your friends and all over social media. And until next time, I'm Square Eye Jack, and I hope you have a great fucking day. Thanks for watching. I think I'm going to go and lie down for a little while. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I am absolutely wrecked. <laughs>